Thank you. Um, Thanks for having I'd me. Like to, okay. I'd like to start with um, a question that we hear a lot from parents. You know, Tulsa Kids, obviously, our readership is parents with children. <laughs> so there are a lot of um, people working at home with their partners 24 7 which can be great but it can also be stressful so do you have some tips for those partners ma maintaining some harmony in the home and sort of ma uh, minimizing the stress absolutely well i think that's been a, a big shift for a lot of people and i say this as a professional and as someone who is at home with my partner and my nine-year-old son so um, i feel it on a couple different levels but i think one of the biggest things is just for partners to be open and clear with each other about their experience about um, expectations about their needs and i think one of the real negative things that can happen is when one or both are experiencing stress or they're feeling you know irritated or annoyed that one partner's work schedule is maybe um, taking precedence over another's, but they don't talk about that, then that's where the resentment and the tension builds up. So I would encourage everyone to be really clear and open um, and try to find some level of compromise about how they can kind of both um, not just work, but kind of exist together 24 seven, which is not typically what a lot of um, partners experience, you know, outside of this pandemic. The other thing I would say is to make sure that you're continuing to try to maintain your romantic relationship as well. It can be easy to think that, well, I'm with them all the time now. We don't need to do anything special or try to connect on any other levels um, because we're together all the time, right? But it's probably not quality time that you're spending together all the time. So to try to continue to, you know, have conversations at the end of the day or connect about things other than work or stress or kids, um, to continue to try to have some type of you know, date night, even if that's just, you know, doing a puzzle or watching a movie together, but something that continues to maintain that romantic relationship that you have outside of now really what's in some ways a working relationship, right? Um, to try to keep things kind of special in that sense. And lastly, I, I did just want to say, you know, it's really, really typical for people to be experiencing greater levels of tension in their relationship as they adjust to this new normal. Um, but what's not typical is for there to be abusive language or behavior. And so I do just want to say really clearly, if that's kind of what people are experiencing, that there are a lot of places that they can reach out and talk with someone about that. In Tulsa, Domestic Violence Intervention Services has a crisis line. Um, there's also some national crisis lines. So even though this is a typical experience to have more stress and tension in, in your relationship, it's still not... Um, a reason to have anything you would label as abusive or problematic in that way. So there are resources for that if that's more the level of what people are, are experiencing. Yeah, thank you for sharing that um, uh, resource because I I, uh, I think you know you're talking about communicating, you're talking about uh, discussing expectations, but if that escalates, there are places that people can go. That or mm -hmm. or call to absolutely that. Yeah. Um, so another point of stress could be, and you know, maintaining that. Uh, I I I find it. I'm glad that you brought up the idea of maintaining that relationship that you have just with your partner outside of work, outside of the children, um, which I'm sure would would help with the stress level. Um, one of the the major stressors for some people uh, in working from home is they also have their children at home and uh, their daycares are not open um, schools are closed so they're taking on not only teaching duties in addition to 24 7 childcare duties where they're normally uh, able to get away a little bit um, how would how would you talk to your partner maybe and usually this is tip typical is I think the mom typically takes on more of those duties. So how would you talk to your partner maybe about sharing those duties a little bit more when maybe they're not used to doing it? Sure. Yeah. And I think especially if you have a relationship where one of you was maybe the primary caregiver and now the person who wasn't is also at home, 
how do you continue to maintain those roles? What does that look like? How does it look different? As you know, the demands have changed. And um, I think, again, back to being really open and clear, particularly if you're both balancing work schedules, um, you know, talking to each other, maybe having a meeting at the beginning of every week between the two of you and saying, what do you have this week that you absolutely need to have kind of protected time for? And really kind of support one another in that. And then also following up that if you've decided, you know, you're going to work for the afternoon and I'll work for the morning, supporting each other enough to set those boundaries and to, um, you know, hold up your end of the bargain, so to speak. If you are going to be um, on call for kids in the morning, being on call for kids in the morning, even if they're used to maybe going to the other parents. Um, and maybe even depending on the age of your kids, just talking with them about too, you know, right now, um, mom needs to do this, so please come to me if you have questions. Or right now, you know, um, your dad or whoever the caregiver is needs to do this, please come and talk with me if you have concerns or something. And letting the kids be aware of those boundaries too. The other thing I would say, um, just as a general kind of communication idea between partners is to be really aware of how you start the conversation. So one of the um, couples therapists that I really like um, are doctors John and Julie Gottman, and they talk about this idea called a softened startup. And the idea is that in research, we know that a significant, um, well, so that the way you start a conversation has a significant impact on the outcome of it, right? Um, particularly when you're talking about parenting, um, people can feel pretty defensive. And so being aware of um, being able to complain, so say what it is that you are concerned about without blaming the other person, using I statements, um, being very clear about the fact that you still appreciate that person. All of those things go a long way towards setting the stage for a conversation that can be productive rather than tense or stressful. So saying something like, you know, I feel like, or I've noticed that I take on um, more of the homeschooling responsibilities this week. We had talked about us uh, sharing those, um, and I feel like it's impacting my work that I've been taking on more of those. Can we please talk about how we might be able to, you know, compromise or how we might be able to structure our schedule so that we can um, have more of a balance in those two? Versus what you may want to say, which is, hey, why aren't you helping out with the kids? You know, I'm doing all this work. You need to pull your weight or whatever that is. Um, so trying to start it in such a way that people are feel open to hearing you can go a long way in that sense as well. Yeah. So more communication and, and, mm -hmm. and communicating in the right way, uh, I guess. Yes. You know, sometimes, sometimes mm -hmm. we forget it with our own family members just to be polite with one another, I think, you know, that exactly. can go a long way. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, another, another question that, uh, that I've heard a lot is people seem to, parents seem to have a lot of anxiety about the fall, about school starting, um, kids going away to college, lack of childcare. I, there's a whole host of um, uncertain uh, things that could happen in the fall. So how do, uh, if, if you're feeling anxious about that, about uh, not knowing what is going to happen in the future in two months or three months time, how do you handle that uncertainty and that anxiety that that might be causing for some people? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I mean, from what I know from my own practice and then from therapists I've talked to across um, the country, really, this is probably one of the biggest issues that people are talking about in therapy right now. And then even outside of therapy, of course, but this idea of things are so uncertain. Um, as humans, we want to know what the future holds. We want to have some level of certainty and I mean, even from an evolutionary perspective, we wanted to know that because that's part of how we survived, right? To be able to not predict the future, but have some sense of what we should expect. Um, and so to not have that at all is really distressing. And so I think the first step is just acknowledging that you're having a really typical and normal reaction to a really distressing event, that you're not alone in that, that this is a collective kind of um, really terrible situation we're all in. Um, and that this response, even especially for people who've never experienced anxiety before and may even have anxiety about their anxiety because it's a new experience, acknowledging that this is just a typical response for a really, really, um, 
you know, abnormal situation that no one has ever experienced before. And then I think too, um, trying to focus on some things that you can control, that you can predict. So, you know, maybe having more of a schedule than you might have so that you know kind of what to expect on a day-to-day -day basis or setting small goals for yourself so you feel some level of accomplishment or some level of kind of um, awareness of what the future might hold for you too. And then I think trying to um, find some way to see some sort of positive in this really unusual experience and not to minimize the, you know, vast number of negative aspects of it, but doing something like, you know, working with your kids on a time capsule from this time or journaling or, you know, taking a picture a day of what your life looks like while you're all at home in quarantine, those types of things that can allow you to see some of the kind of maybe not necessarily completely positive, but at least unusual in uh, kind of different circumstances we're in right now, see it for maybe slightly, maybe a fun way um, that allows you to um, not just focus on all the negative aspects of it, which can be really easy and understandable to do. And then I would also say, of course, um, this is a great time to reach out um, for support, whether that's from family and friends or from, you know, a licensed professional. We have seen a huge increase in the number of people accessing therapy services, particularly from people who've never done that before. Um, so much of what we're experiencing now is outside of what anyone could have predicted or has experienced before. So we're not supposed to know how to handle it. You know, we're not supposed to know what to do or um, how to move forward necessarily. And so working with a licensed professional can be a great way to kind of process some of your own experience as well as talk about how do I move from this place of anxiety to a place of a little bit more hopefulness or maybe even just kind of managed anxiety if that's what it needs to look like. So, and most therapists right now are still doing um, therapy via teletherapy services. Um, and so it's a little bit easier in that sense to access right now as well. You can do it from home and not have to worry about going out and getting childcare and things like that. So it can also be a great time to start um, building that relationship right now as well. Right. Thank you. That, that's good advice. Can people go to OSU or, or is OSU counseling open to anyone or just students? Yes. Yeah. So we actually, the vast majority of our clients are community members. We absolutely see OSU students, faculty, and staff, um, but we see a lot of community members from around Tulsa. So we are doing teletherapy services through the summer. Um, so we are open and available, as well as many of the other um, mental health agencies across the city. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. That, um, what you were when you were talking about feeling that sense maybe sense of loss of community or friendships i know a lot of my friendships came from taking my kids to school or going to sporting events taking my kids to soccer and talking on the sidelines we've lost parents have lost all of that and i think there's a probably a real sense of loss and a real sense of loneliness and isolation for people um so what what can people do to maybe fill in some of that loss or fill in for some of that isolation that they may be feeling um, as they go through this? Absolutely. Yeah, I think the isolation has been probably one of the hardest aspects of this for a lot of people, particularly those who relied on maybe, you know, workplace um, relationships or those, you know, like um, parents of kids, friends at school, people that you don't necessarily see on a day-to-day -day basis if you're not just out there around them, right? Um, and so one of the things that I would encourage people to think about first is, again, back to that piece of acknowledging your experience, but a lot of what the psychology community has talked about um, in terms of kind of how to frame this time is to think about it as grief in a way. You're grieving some of those relationships that you're not able to maintain in the same way. Um, you're grieving a lot of these losses of experiences that you expected to have, whether that's birthdays or anniversaries or, you know, kids ending the school year without seeing their teachers again or whatever that looks like. So align yourself to acknowledge that this is a really difficult kind of grief process um, and that it may take some time to feel kind of fully like yourself again in that way. But in terms of connecting with others, um, I would say being very intentional about it, which may be a shift for some people. So especially if you were someone who was used to connecting um, when you were in the classroom with your kid or at sporting events or at your workplace, um, you may have gotten those connections in kind of a built-in way. 
and not had to do quite as much to reach out and maintain them versus now, um, even if it's a little bit outside of your comfort zone, in order to maintain those, you're probably going to have to be pretty intentional about calling or texting or you know getting on social media or Zoom calls or whatever that looks like for you. Um, and then the other thing I would say is encouraging yourself to um, kind of step outside of what you may feel like doing at that time. One of the things that can happen with isolation is an increased sense of kind of depression or just kind of hopelessness or sadness, um, which can lead to more isolation as you feel like you need to withdraw from other people. But if you can push yourself just a little bit to reach out and connect, maybe with your closest friends or family members, and maybe even for five or 10 minutes at a time, but allowing yourself to have some of that social connection and then check in and say, how do I feel afterwards? The odds are you probably will feel better. And remembering that for the next time when maybe I don't feel like calling someone, well, remember the last time I actually did feel better. Maybe I should do that. And then I would say too, there are a lot of support groups that are being put online. Um, Mental Health Association in Tulsa has a lot of online support groups for a variety of different um, kinds of situations. And we've seen all sorts of different virtual groups and things across the country. So maybe even something like that that you may not have done before, being part of an online community, um, could be something to try out now and just see if it works. The good thing is it's real easy to not do it again if it ends up not being something that fits well for you. But it can be a great point of connection um, in a way that maybe you hadn't expected to connect with people before. That's uh, that's great advice. Um, I. I've never done Zoom meetings before. Now I do them all the time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but I think going back to maybe one of your very first points is we're all going through this together. So everyone, I think, is feeling some sense of confusion, isolation, loneliness. And, and so other people are looking for ways to reach out as well. So I exactly. think thinking in those terms, can it, it's, that's a very good point. Um, Absolutely. The, uh, we had a question from a reader um, that says I'm, it, that she's finding it difficult to change tasks and remember information and cope with deadlines during this time of quarantine, school and remote work and home life. She's asking if it could possibly be that she has ADD that was manageable before and this has brought that out or is she just responding to this situation? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question and actually something I've heard from a lot of people and something I think I've probably experienced a little bit myself too. Um, while I don't know her particular situation so I can't speak to you know what does or doesn't fit for her, I will say in general that's been something we've heard from a lot of people is that they're feeling more scatterbrained or having a harder time remembering things or staying on task. Maybe what they could do in an eight hour workday before, you know, they can't even fit in four hours of focused work now. Um, not just because of kids, but just because of the ability to focus and concentrate. And really what that probably amounts to for most people is the fact that we're under a lot of stress. So I think I said before, we're experiencing this kind of collective trauma in a way. And one of the things we know is that your body and your mind's response to stress, um, it makes it harder to focus and concentrate for longer periods of time, right? You're in this kind of fight or flight um, place where you can't concentrate and focus in the way that you could when you weren't in that. So for most people, I think it probably comes down to being in a, a place of increased stress, increased anxiety, um, increased demands, you know, household demands that you didn't have before. And so some of it may just be giving yourself some grace to say, well, this is a really weird time. You know, we're all struggling with this in a way. But then I would also say if you're really concerned about your level of forgetfulness or ability to concentrate or focus, you can always reach out to um, a therapist, to your primary care doctor, and maybe talk with them more at length about your own kind of um, experience if you feel like it's maybe above that level of what we might think is typical of kind of forgetfulness, scatterbrainness, things like that, that happen when you're under stress. Yeah, I was glad to see that question because mm -hmm. I'm having a little yeah. bit of a problem focusing on work. Sure, yeah, <laughs> or what day it is or things like yeah. that, yeah. Uh -huh. We have a, another question from, this is from Facebook. 
Uh, hi, Dr. Sarah. Thanks for being here. One question I have is how do we manage helping our family members and younger children manage their anxieties while also trying to manage our own anxious feelings? Good question. Mm -hmm. That's a great question, and it's a really tough one. I mean, it's hard enough, like we've just been talking about, to manage your own anxieties, much less to try to help your little kids um, manage those is um, particularly difficult, I think. One thing I would say is to be cognizant of the age and developmental level of your own child. So if we're talking about someone who's you know, 16, 17, that's a pretty different space than maybe if you have a five-year-old at home. Right, so being really aware of the level of information that they're ingesting, both from maybe watching the news with you or reading things on their own, and just kind of maybe what you and your partner are talking about at home. Um, being cognizant of not continuing to kind of process a lot of your own anxieties out loud with little ones of, around, because they'll take on more of that than we think that they might, right? And I would say trying to meet them at a place where they can express some of their own, get it out of their little bodies in a way that works for them. So for instance, for little kids, that may be art or that may be, I mean, the, the language of kids is play. So allowing them to act things out, playing with them, connecting with them in that way, getting some of that anxiety out um, in that sense. For older kids, it may be a conversation where you talk with them about um, how are you feeling? What are you worried about? And then on the other side of that, really acknowledging um, the um, kind of soundness of their anxiety, so not minimizing it. Even if what they're anxious about or sad about isn't maybe what you would be sad about, you know, they're anxious, they're sad about, they were really looking forward to this one thing they were doing in art class at school, which to you may not seem like the biggest of deals, you know, and uh, as opposed to all these other things going on, but for them, that's a big change. And so also, um, not only helping them kind of process some of those feelings, but also acknowledging, yeah, that is really sad. I'm really sorry that that's been your experience. I hope that next year we can work on a different kind of art thing, or maybe we can work on that art thing at home together. Um, so giving some kind of voice in a way that's developmentally appropriate for them, which again, for younger kids, is going to look more like play, really kind of active activities, maybe running around or doing art or things like that. For older kids, some of that too but also maybe some more kind of specific conversations with those kids that are kind of old enough and articulate enough to be able to do that. So if you do have older children, um, yeah. should you share your anxiety with them if you're feeling anxious? Mm -hmm. I think you can to an extent. Um, I don't think that they need or should um, take on all of your anxiety as an adult. Part of the job of of the adult in the home is to kind of hold some of that themselves, right? Um, I think you can express it in such a way that creates a platform for them to feel comfortable expressing theirs. So that may be, you know, I, I'm feeling kind of anxious or, you know, yeah, I, I'm worried about going back to work the next month or, hey, I found out I'm going back to work next week. I'm a little bit nervous about it. Um, or oh, let's wear our masks or whatever that kind of looks like for you to just kind of set that platform but then really give them the space to process their own anxieties and not continue to kind of go on and on. Use your partner or your friends or your family to really process in depth. I think it's, I think it's helpful for kids and research shows for kids whose parents express and model emotions and saying, I have these emotions and I can experience them and I can hold them and be okay with it. But going into like a deep emotional processing and laying all your worries on them tends to be uh, more harmful than helpful. Okay. Find some kind of balance that way. Yeah. Well, speaking of partners and balance, um, many parents are dealing with this as single parents um, mm -hmm. and also having to handle some, uh, an ex possibly. And I know mm -hmm. I've heard from some parents that they're having some difficulty with the ex not uh, following uh, protocol of cleanliness or being around others or social distancing. Um, and being very concerned about the child's health, but their own health if the child brings something back into the home. So how would you, are there tips for navigating that with an ex? Yeah. Well, I think one of the things that's really difficult about that is you have a history with that person too, and probably not maybe the best of histories, right? You have a lot of kind of emotions and, you know, past experiences you're drawing on. So I would say the first thing is to try to focus on the task at hand. You know, 
it can be really easy to get drawn back into conversations um, or feelings even of, oh, well, this person's always doing this or they never listen to me or whatever that is. And that all may be very true. But if you're wanting someone to try to kind of get on board with your, with your ideas, so to speak, um, focusing on the present is going to be much more helpful and go further than continuing to kind of get back into some of those past issues. So I would say back to that idea of that um, softened startup, that creating a conversation that at least tries as much as possible to facilitate something that feels really productive. Approaching it as a team, you know, it's not me against you as an ex-partner, it's us together as parents. And so how can we work together to create the safest space for our kid? Because that's ultimately what hopefully we're both trying to do. Um, and trying to present kind of facts, um, trying to keep it pretty focused on this is what I've read or this is what I've been told, this is what I'd like to do, how can we work together to do this? And maybe being creative as well. You know, maybe they're not willing to not have anyone come over to their house, but they're willing to say, hey, the kid, if they're old enough, can maybe stay in their room while people come over or whatever some of those kind of creative compromises can look like. And then I would say too, I mean, also focusing on what you can do in your home on your time to help your kiddo um, create good kind of cleanly habits and things, you know, you can work with them to wash their hands for 20 seconds at a time, or you can provide them a mask and maybe see um, if co-parent is okay with them wearing it around or things like that. Um, so also not only kind of trying to get on board with the co-parent, but also setting up some kind of contingency things as well, in a sense, um, in case some of those don't kind of come to fruition on the co-parent side. Mm -hmm. Is You've mentioned a, a couple of times, obviously, uh, this idea of communicating and good communication between partners. Mm -hmm. How, is there a, it, are there classes or is there a book mm -hmm. or something that you could suggest if, if people feel like, gosh, I just don't know how to do that. Uh, and it's not their pattern of communication. Mm -hmm. And we fall into those same maybe negative patterns sometimes. Can you suggest any mm -hmm. resources for good communication? Sure. Yeah. Well, I would say there's probably a whole slew of articles out there. Um, Psychology Today has a really great blog that they have lots of different things on. Um, but I would say in terms of books and such, I, I use the Gottman method for couples therapy and they have several different books. They do a lot of research. They have lots of books that they've used. Um, and there are some that are a little bit more specific to communication. Some are specific to other things, but the seven principles for um, Making Marriage Work is a really great one. It has some kind of pretty basic things to talk through. Um, things that I think would even be applicable in something, you know, an ex-partners or maybe, you know, non-married co-parents or whatever that looks like. Um, some of those kind of basic things. And then also, um, I'm probably a little biased, but I think therapy can be helpful for everyone. And even if what you're talking about in your own individual therapy is wanting to be able to communicate with someone else, that can be super helpful as well. Or if you're still a couple um, and you want to go to therapy around that, um, communication is very often a key focus um, of therapy there. So a couple different options, but yeah, that's one book that I would recommend in particular. Thank you. Um, yeah. I have a final question and this okay. is, this involves social media itself. Um, is, uh, what about, comparing yourself to others. A lot of us are sitting home on our computers all the time. And I know this is an issue that comes up anyway, but uh, it may be more so now. Um, people are looking at their social media and it, it might seem like everyone else is fine or handling it or doing a lot with their kids at home. They're teaching them like crazy and they've got a schedule and they've got their books laid out and, and all their activities going on. And you feel like you're just not there. Um, how, what Can you talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. Yeah, I think social media is such a difficult thing because in some ways it's such a fantastic tool that we have now, especially during this time when we're also socially distanced from one another. There can be some really, really wonderful things about social media. Um, and so it's not all, you know, evil in that sense. But the first question I would ask yourself is why am I on social media right now? What am I looking for from this? And, and really answering that question honestly for yourself can go a long way towards protecting yourself from some of this kind of um, self-esteem blow from looking at 
you know, people's accounts or things. And so if you're going on to connect with people and you're feeling good about it, you're feeling positive, you know, you saw your friend's baby pictures or whatever it is, and that feels great, then continue with that. And that's wonderful. But if you've checked in with yourself and you said, you know, I'm, I'm on social media right now because I'm feeling depressed or I'm feeling kind of isolated. I'm feeling kind of cruddy about how I interacted with my kids today. That may not be the best place um, or the best way for you to cope during that time. So that may be a time where you say, you know what, I'm going to step back. Facebook today, um, not something that's helpful for me. Maybe I can use it tomorrow when I'm feeling a little better, but today I need to take a walk or I need to play with my kids or read a book or whatever that is. So using social media as one of your coping skills and points of connection, but not your only one, because sometimes it doesn't serve us. It actually does, you know, the exact opposite of what we hope that it would do. And I think the other thing too is trying to remind yourself, you know, what do I put on social media? Do I put all of my negative things on there? Probably not. You know, are the pictures of my house on social media of the laundry in the chair? Probably not. They're probably of, you know, the artwork that my kid did that one day that they said that they would do a craft or whatever it is. So also trying to kind of check in and say, hey, what am I making this mean? Am I making this mean that this person's a better parent than me? Well, that's probably not true. You know, they're, I'm also a good parent, even if it looks a little bit differently, or even if it's presented a little bit differently. So trying to kind of also actively challenge some of those thoughts and things that arise as you look through and remind yourself, everyone has different ways of doing things. And a lot of what gets put on social media is not always the most accurate representation of people's day-to-day -day lives anyway. <laughs> yes. Okay, that's great advice. Um, yeah. Is there any, do you have any final thoughts or anything else you would like to say toward the end of this? Um, these have, yeah. uh, this has been great advice, I think, for yeah. parents. Um, Fantastic. I do. You might want to mention again that uh, mm -hmm. people, the community, can go to OSU Tulsa. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. Counseling. Yeah. So, so we see members of the community as well as OSU, um, and the best way to get hold of us is to call us, um, which is nine one eight five nine four. Oh my gosh! I just forgot our phone number. Five nine four eight five six eight. It's been so long since I've five six eight. Yes, nine one eight five nine four eight five six eight. Um, okay. that's the best way to get hold of us. And um, and then also if if we weren't a fit for you, we'd be happy to give additional referrals elsewhere in the community. Um, if you need something that was slightly different kind of focused, we have great connections with a variety of different places around town. So we're also more than happy to work with people to get them um, to the best place for them at this time. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. I, Thank this, you. This was wonderful and such great advice. I know I learned a lot and um, I wanna remind people that we're doing this with OSU Tulsa for the next three weeks. It will be Tuesdays at 10 a.m. same time. People can ask questions. We have our chat open. So if people wanna ask questions, next week we'll be talking to Tia Clayburn, Brooke, I'm sorry, Tia Clayburg and Chantel Lott from OSU Center for Family Resilience. And we're going to be talking about how you can talk with your kids about coronavirus and maybe some of the anxieties they have and so, some ways that you can talk to them about why they can't see grandparents or friends or go to school. So uh, I hope you'll join us next week and thank you so much. Thank you.